Well, as we wait for the last few people to join us, um, I'll just go through with my introduction. I'm Kelsey Kennedy. You cannot see me right now. I'm hidden. Uh, at a, I work at Cook County Higher Education doing programming. Um, my job is to make sure that we bring programming to Cook County that is something that, the in, that is interest of our public. So things and topics that otherwise wouldn't get covered academically. Um, and we actually had heard really wonderful things about Lindsay, uh, another presentation she did for our community and wanted to bring her back on a topic that people seem to be very passionate about, but that wasn't being addressed at the moment. Um, and we at Cook County Higher Ed cover a variety of things, but lifelong learning and workforce development or training and development are some of the things we cover that fall into my bucket. Um, if you have any recommendations for topics you'd love to hear in the future, I would love to see that via email that I'll be sending out after the workshop, um, as well as you can mention that in the chat or the Q&A if there's topics or instructors you'd be excited to hear from in the future. If you're looking for events that we have hosted in the past, because we have been recording our webinars recently, um, many of them are on our website. You can check out at myccahe.org. I do want to let you know this presentation will be recorded. And so for those that may be missing part of it or um, want to watch things slower or want to rewatch things, you will have the opportunity to do that. Um, it will be posted to our website and I will also share the link uh, when I send you an email in the future. Uh, again, if you have any questions, you'll see the Q&A option at the bottom. You will see a chat function at the bottom. You will be muted and you will have your video turned off. So don't be surprised if you aren't able to see us. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a longer presentation. Usually we're doing hour, hour and a half, but we're really excited to have the time to really devote to this uh, topic. So if you uh, have any questions, let us know. We just want you to enjoy this opportunity for learning. Thank you, Lindsay, again, for being willing to present, especially during this time of change when we were excited to have you come up to Cook County. Looking forward to having you from, from the distance. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Gawin Apujin Yinata Anishinaabe Musi, Nengata Gwejitunji Anishinaabe Moyan. Buju, ni Lindsay Indijinakaz Jaganashi Mang, Kazagiskwaji Makag Indunjiba Edashwakar Inda. Gawin Nigakin Namasi Nindodem. Uh, that, uh, hello, welcome everybody. Um, I just gave a traditional Ojibwe greeting, um, beginning with a humbling statement. Um, humility is such a large part of our culture and our culture is really ingrained in our language. Um, and the instructor I learned Ojibwe from, uh, Dan Jones, uh, when I was attending University of Minnesota Morris, um, started out teaching us that in that way about how important it is to remain humble in this. So the first statement that I actually said was that I don't, I don't know how to talk uh, Ojibwe very much, but I'll try talking Ojibwe today. Um, I, for reasons that I will mention in our time together today, um, uh, only learned probably a few words of my traditional language uh, as I grew up, you know, things that just uh, words that were used regularly in conversation uh, throughout families, but I never was fluent and I still unfortunately am not fluent in my language. Um, but I really appreciate the learning that I have done um, once I got to University of Minnesota Morris um, and learning from the gentleman I mentioned, Dan Jones, was uh, such a, a humbling experience in itself because he was such a great, not only knowledgeable about our language, but about our culture, um, which is really a, a, an important piece um, of the way uh, our language and worldview is structured. So um, I wanted to give you that traditional greeting in Ojibwe. Um, I told you also that my name is Lindsay McMurrin. I'm a citizen of the Leech Lake Nation of Ojibwe uh, in, in live in the Walker area on the shores of beautiful Leech Lake. Um, and we, uh, uh, I also mentioned that I don't know my clan um, in the Ojibwe um, uh, cultural systems. Um, our uh, clan system is an important piece of, uh, of family and community and relationship as well. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know what clan I'm from because that knowledge was lost along the way over generations because of some of the things, again, um, and topics that we'll be addressing today. So, um, again, I am so thankful for the opportunity to be here with all of you. Um, it's, it's different. It's different for me as a presenter. I'm used to interacting with my audience. Um, it's really kind of a sterile, strange experience talking to a screen and especially not being able to see faces um, and, and get that, that interaction that I'm used to. Um, however, that being said, I'm so grateful that this technology the, in these days that we're able to still connect even while physical distancing 
Um, so I think that social connection is really important. It's such a key part of this topic. I would have loved to be in the room with all of you as we talk about this because um, each one of us has uh, been affected by the things we're gonna talk about today. And I wanna encourage everybody to take care of yourself um, as we navigate some of these difficult, um, difficult uh, pieces of our history um, that we're all impacted by. Um, and as we really work to find ways that we can be effective in moving forward um, uh, as, uh, individual as individuals, as families, as communities, and as a larger community um, working together to really start to address uh, healing on all levels. So um, our topic today <laughs> on the screen is understanding the impact of historical trauma. I mentioned that um, on the screen as well, I have my title. I, I come here today um, kind of as an offshoot of some other work that I do. I am the Director of Prevention Initiatives and Tribal Projects with Minnesota Communities Caring for Children. Um, it was through my organization that I was able to uh, work with other members of your community uh, in Grand Marais uh, a few months back. Um, and it, it was my first time up in your area and it's beautiful. Um, so I was really happy to be able to to be there and I look forward to seeing uh, com coming back again when we're able. Um, the reason why I mention that is because it's really important for us to understand how all of our topics kind of weave together. Now we're going to be talking about historical trauma. However, I'm also going to be touching on the impact of toxic stress in the developing brain, um, the impact of adverse childhood experiences, um, as well as what intergenerational uh, adversity looks like, the connection to historical trauma, um, and epigenetics. Um, so lots of different things, but they, they all will thread together. Uh, language is important to me. So uh, again, the, the, the official title here is Understanding the Impact of Historical Trauma, but to me what we're really talking about is more so uh, described here, rooted in resilience trauma, strength, and overcoming. So oftentimes when we come to topics like this, um, it can be overwhelming. Um, and oftentimes the focus is on the pain, is on the trauma, is on the, the, um, how we've been hurt. Now we need to acknowledge it, we need to talk about it, that's, that's a, the first step in healing. But ultimately what I, the message that I want people to hear today um, is also one of hope. It's one of um, overcoming. It's one of being strengthened by our, the generations that have come before us. It's one about our own responsibility to strengthen uh, our families, right? And, and what we do and how we choose to show up in the world. So then we'll see that ripple in generations to come as well. And we'll continue on a path towards healing, towards learning from history, learning from um, opportunities that are challenges that we've overcome where maybe we can recognize now that even though we intended to do good in the situation maybe our actions um, were actually more harmful than what we uh, intended so again that difference between intention and impact as well is something for us to think about so again if this is a message of hope and I want to approach it that way yes we're going to talk about hard things and we're also going to talk about what that means to overcome, what that means to heal, what that means to continue down that path um, towards equity, inclusion, growth, thriving, transcending, all of those things for everybody. So I'm going to start here. Pose this question to you. Take a moment and think about it. Um, feel free to put your response in the chat box. Again, this is so, so, it's such a different experience for me uh, not having as much interaction with the audience. Um, but go ahead and think about it. Um, no wrong answer here. Um, what comes to mind for you when you think of your roots? It's always interesting um, by way of explanation of, of, of why I decided to, to open my, my presentations this way. Um, first and foremost, of course, it's because I got to put a picture of my two youngest kiddos uh, and mama there on the screen, got to brag about my kiddos a little bit. Um, and second of all, it really captures a lot of what I hope my children will, uh, 
how I hope they will reply if they're posed uh, with this question um, as, as they grow older too. I see an answer in the chat box about, uh, you know, it being connected to how our primary caregiver took care of us, most definitely. Um, right. Um, and, and that impacts us um, on a lifelong basis um, as well, so most definitely. The other reason um, why I chose this picture, right, so I said it was also because I hope um, it kind of embodies some things that my kids will say someday. Uh, one of those being family traditions, right? So uh, in the photo here, we are, it was in the fall, um, we've made it a family tradition to go out and visit one of the area farms. Um, they'll put it on a little bit of a, a, a corn maze, fall festival type thing. And there's usually animals, like uh, the little petting zoo area of the farm that they have set up, um, all those kind of good fun things. Uh, my family and I have made, started to make that a tradition. So again, um, when I look at this picture, I hope my kids talk about that, that you know we celebrated together as a family. We did fun things. We had things we looked forward to every year. Um, I mentioned these are my two boys. So my littlest, um, this picture is a few years old. He's actually gonna turn four next month, um, but that's Tobias. He uh, has the most rambunctious little personality and so much energy, and I love him to pieces. But it's so different from my oldest son, Isaiah. Uh, he is a third grader. Uh, he's nine, nine and a half years old, he reminds me now. And he is exactly like mom. I tend to be a little bit more shy, reserved. I'm always thinking um, before I speak, uh, laid back, uh, kind of easygoing. Um, and Isaiah is a lot like me. Uh, again, that contrast is just shown even brighter, right? Thinking about Toby, we often call him the Tobnado. Now, the reason why I'm talking about all this is because family dynamics are all different. Um, they're all unique. Um, and the roots of even the, what some of the people sharing the same home can also be different, right? So my oldest son uh, here, Isaiah, he, his dad um, immigrated from Mexico. So when Isaiah goes and visits his dad and stepmom and their family down in Morris, he often learns uh, more about his Spanish, his Mexican American culture, which is great, right? Spanish is the first language in the home there. Um, it's such a, uh, between the food and the music and, and the culture, um, it's such a rich thing for a person to be exposed to no matter what. Um, but I'm thankful for that. Uh, Toby, um, his family uh, has run a business for three generations ongoing now um, about well drilling. And so, you know, again, that's part of Toby's story, um, but also of all of us as a family. That being said, um, there's also things that my kids might answer that I, I wouldn't be uh, that I haven't mentioned first yet, right? So, you know, some of those memories or some of those difficulties that we all go through as families. I raised both of my boys um, as a single parent for a large portion of their lives. Um, and I'm and now, I uh, have two bonus kiddos that grew in my heart in addition to these two who grew in my belly um, as a stepmom to Toby's older brother and sister as well. So we have a big family. Um, but we all have bring our own stories uh, to that. And those experiences that we've had also shape how we see the world around us, how we uh, uh, perceive situations that are happening. Um, two people can be in the exact same room, having that same thing happen to them and be experiencing it very differently depending upon their backgrounds, their upbringing, their roots, um, all of those things. So it's a lot to take in, um, but that's, also the larger picture um, that, we're, that we're really thinking about and what we're really talking about um, as we go through these activities we're going to talk about today. Um, I saw another answer was about um, knowing, you know, our genealogy, knowing where we came from or what we're connected to. And that's such a crucial understanding for all of us as we form our own, our, our own identities and find our own places in, in the world. Um, some folks don't know um, and, and some, uh, might wish that they didn't, right? That, uh, there's such a complex variety of um, situations um, that we all uh, are connected to in one way or another. So again, when we think of our roots, 
that can bring up a, a wide array of emo emotions and uh, thoughts and feelings um, for people. And that's okay. And that's what this work is really all about. So um, let's see where we were at here. Let's get that over. The quote I have on the screen um, is from a, a indigenous leader and activist um, from Canada, George Erasmus, and he says this, where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. Where community is to be formed, common memory must be created. Now I want us to think about that for a minute. What does that mean to you? What kind of thoughts um, does that bring up? Um, how is it connected to our topics we're talking about today? Feel free to pop any thoughts into the chat box um, as well. I grew up um, in the town uh, where I'm living now. I moved away for about seven years when I went to college um, and then some time beyond that. Uh, but I ended up back here to raise my kids. And one of the things um, that I experienced, so Walker is you know, about five miles off the Leech Lake Reservation. Um, we're a tourist town, right? Uh, we have, uh, even today I saw such a huge influx of out of state plates and, and that type of thing, people already coming in, even though we're in our current situation. Uh, anyhow, uh, we also um, have a, a K through 12 school in Walker uh, that I attended, had a great experience there in a lot of ways. And, and now, especially looking back and, and understanding more in the area of study I went into um, in college and in my career has really shown me some of the hard parts too, right? So this common memory piece, when common memory is lacking. When I, I attended high school here and I was on student council and I remember bringing a request to the school board um, to bring an anthropology, a friend had, had talked about wanting to bring an anthropology class in. Um, and so I thought, well, how about bringing in more of our history, you know, more of our American Indian history. Certainly we talked, we talked, we touched on things in social studies or history class, um, so on and so forth, but it was mostly just memorizing dates, um, study for tests, right? Um, so I, I brought up the idea of, you know, to a teacher I, I still see and uh, I'm very fond of, and I just said, you know, why don't we have more classes that talk about my people's history, you know, and, um, his reply, I don't believe was intended to be disrespectful. He just said, you know, well, we don't, you know, we're a small school. We don't have money for special electives. And to me, learning about the history of the land where you're living <laughs> um, is what learning about the history of the American Indian or indigenous or Native American people is for me. Um, you know, it's not a special elective. It shouldn't be, anyhow. Um, this is the land in which we live. These are our community members, our neighbors, um, our own family in some cases, right? And so just this idea that, well, it's, you know, that's a special elective. When really, for me, what, uh, my, what I wish my common memory, what common memory shared in, in my area would be is that understanding that that's not American Indian history, that's not indigenous history. That's the history of Minnesota, that's the history of our country. You know, um, it's all of our history. So for me, when I came across this quote, it kind of captured that idea of what my purpose is in going out into communities uh, and sharing this information. And it's part of it is to help create that common memory. There's a lot of um, things that I know as an indigenous person um, because of, Maybe my own interest in it or you know I the, I really dug into this work in college um, I was studying cultural anthropology and American Indian studies um, and so you know the more and more that I learned that I hadn't learned earlier on in life um, the more I guess it cemented to me what my mission is and it is to go out and make sure that people are informed because when we understand more about our history more about where we've been right then we can understand more about what we want to do now today to to really control where we're going next um, as a community, you know, as a state, as a country, so on and so forth. So 
anyhow, I thought, I thought that was a fitting quote. So what we're trying to do here um, is to strengthen community, right, through making sure that we're creating that common memory where we share in the same understanding uh, and awareness of issues that are still impacting all of us today. So we're gonna take a little bit of a detour um, for a moment because I feel like this information is so important for us to understand. And this is such a part of self-care, um, both in the moment, right, as we start to hear some misinformation, as well as in, a long run, in the long run of really practicing resilience. Um, so being able to understand what's going on in our bodies and in our brains when we're stressed out is so important. Um, I think I am going to ask for that poll or that question. Um, and we added a couple questions that we were going to ask um, of audience members just to, to kind of gauge where we're at with our current understanding of some of these topics. Um, so can we start with, uh, yep, there we go. Thank you. So you can click on that and you will be able to um, give your feedback into um, if you have heard of ACEs before. Yep, so adverse childhood experiences. Give you another second for the last couple of you to. Mm -hmm. This is really helpful for me because then, you know, I'll kind of know where, where we're starting from and, and all of that good stuff. I could talk about all this for days on, upon days upon days because I'm so passionate about it. Um, and it's been so transformative in my own life, personally and professionally. So you can see the results right there. Great. This is very helpful. Thank you. All right. So um, for starters, um, adverse childhood experiences are um, uh, it's coming out of an original study um, where it's talking about how we're impacted by basically the biology of stress. So what happens in our brains um, when we're undergoing those kind of traumatic experiences over and over and over again. Um, I will get a little bit more into to some of that um, as we go along today, but I wanted to pause here um, and start to address like that neurobiological um, piece of it and why um, these adversities are so impactful on health and social outcomes. Um, and so part of the study is looking at how multiple forms of adversity um, compound, then creating uh, more actual uh, health issues uh, with that individual, um, as well as a higher propensity for negative social outcomes. Keeping in mind, this is an epidemiological study, meaning it's a study of a population as a whole. Um, Again, for now, I'm going to pause there, um, but I promise we will touch a little bit more on that and it'll start connecting uh, a little bit better in a, a moment here. So um, the way I want to talk about this is uh, I want you to notice what's happening in your body right now. Um, I understand a two and a half hour webinar is lengthy. Um, and it's hard to focus sometimes, right? So just notice what's going on in your body. Go ahead and kind of stretch out if you need to. Notice if maybe your foot's asleep from sitting funny. Um, just all those different sensations that are happening. Now, I want you to go ahead and take a deep breath. Um, and try to sit up straight. Take a deep breath in through your nose, inhaling slowly. Holding and exhaling. Go ahead and do that again on your own. For me, part of what's been so transformative about this work um, is again to be learning about what's going on inside our bodies when we're feeling stress. Now, we just did a, a short body scan, right, to see how we were feeling, took a couple deep breaths together. Um, what's been amazing to me is how something as simple as that <laughs> is mindfulness. That is part of helping with self-regulation, helping with co-regulation. So the idea of when we are feeling stressed or scared or angry, you know, all those really strong emotions, that we also know how we can start putting the brakes on that and calming ourselves back, back down. One of the best examples of seeing this, um, the reason why, that taking a deep breath, counting to 10, actually works. Um, Dr. Dan Siegel talks about, um, he's the author of The Whole Brain Child, um, 
many other things as well. Um, but he uses this analogy, he calls it the hand brain model. Um, so I'm gonna teach that all, to all of you today. So um, our brains, our central nervous system, it all develops from the most primitive to the most advanced. So imagine that right here is your spinal cord. Right here is your brain stem. You go ahead and fold your finger over into the center of your hand. Think about that as your limbic system. That is that fight, flight or freeze response that happens when we feel strong emotion. So our limbic system is made up of our hippocampus and our amygdala. Um, and think about that. Um, so that, again, I'm, I'm telling you also in the order of things forming, right? So that's one of the earliest things that form because it all comes down really to survival. Um, it's that fight or flight instinct, right? So keep that in mind. Go ahead and fold your fingers over. Here's your cortex. And right here is your prefrontal cortex. Um, and that is where the executive functioning takes place, right? That um, deep thought and reasoning, responsible decision-making, um, impulse control, like all those types of things takes place right here. So as I mentioned before, when we get scared, um, when we feel threatened, what happens? is that we flip our lids. That's a very technical term, right? <laughs> but it, it, it's a good way that Dr. Dan Siegel describes this because what happens is following his hand brain model, we flip our lids, right? Meaning our prefrontal cortex goes offline and it is a biological impossibility to access our prefrontal cortex when our, we're stuck in our limbic system, when that fight, flight, or freeze response um, has kicked in. So the things that help us hug our amygdala, so to speak, <laughs> and by that I mean helps us uh, calm down, helps regulate, regulate those stress hormones, uh, and helps uh, regulate breathing and heartbeat and all those things, and get into our thinking brain faster, is that simple activity that we did earlier of taking a deep breath. Now, it's not as easy as that, right? But that's one example of a tool that can be used, breathing techniques, um, to be able to um, metabolize all those stress hormones and get back uh, into our prefrontal cortex, being able to connect um, to the higher reasoning um, quicker. And some other examples of things that help with that are physical activity, right? Exercise, um, that tends to help metabolize those stress hormones, um, cortisol and the such as well, um, getting us again back into our thinking brain quicker. Now, this is, for me, has been a revelation, just in my parenting style, even um, in my conversations with my, the rest of my family, my spouse, so on and so forth. Like being able to understand and notice in your body, right, what it feels like when you're starting to get angry, right? Sometimes people say they feel it in their belly. Sometimes they, people say they'll feel it in their chest, right? And it's, it's that stress response system gearing up, ramping up um, to kick in. So, um, What's really interesting as well is that our amygdala, right? Sometimes it's called our reptilian brain. Um, keep in mind that that is one of the most primitive parts of our brain. That being said, survival uh, is really the name of the game for this part of our brain. So here's the thing. Um, it actually can't differentiate between real and perceived stress or real or perceived danger. Um, has anybody ever heard of the movie, the documentary Paper Tigers? It's around these ideas of adverse childhood experiences, toxic stress, impact on the developing brain. And the reason why they call it paper tigers, right, is the idea that um, our brains, when they sense danger, whether it's a tiger, a real tiger in the wild, or whether it's seeing one drawn or a one of a photograph, there is a, a second where our brain doesn't differentiate. Of course, now that's saying, not saying that that lasts, but again, our amygdala gets ramped up because it, it, even that perceived danger can really be um, triggering, depending upon also what our baseline is with our stress response levels. So again, I wanna be very um, transparent about trying to continue to make the connection to all, uh, with all of these topics, um, with that, what our main topic is today. Now, thinking about the brain and stress, thinking about what happens as we move through life. Here's the next piece of that, that puzzle. There's all kinds of different types of stress, right? And we know that as human beings, we're never going to escape stress completely. Um, keeping in mind as well, there's positive stressors, right? It's kind of that stress that I was feeling this morning as I was preparing, knowing I was getting ready to deliver this presentation to all of you. I kind of had the butterflies in the tummy uh, feeling, right? But 
and, and what that does is that ramps us up for performance. Um, the same thing with athletes or with uh, dancers or actors or actresses. Um, our body is responding in a way that can lend itself to our success, right? Because if we're, if we're feeling that kind of nervousness, a little bit of anxiety, that also helps us perform better because we have that increase in heart rate. And it's a mild elevation in stress hormones, but it keeps us on our toes. So again, our body functions uh, in very predictable ways and ways that really, again, is lending itself to, to help us in the situations we're in. We also know that there is tolerable stress. Now, this kind of stress is more serious. Um, it's not necessarily a positive stressor. Um, however, what differentiates tolerable stress from toxic stress is that tolerable stress often is buffered by supportive relationships. So a couple examples of what tolerable stress might look like, um, breaking an arm and having to go to the hospital, um, getting in a car accident, um, you know, it's not to diminish the impact that these events are having on us, um, but again, there's a little bit of a differentiation there. Um, those supportive relationships or having the resources there to deal with a problem is really what differentiates this from some of the other forms of stress we're going to be talking about today. Um, just give me a minute to make sure I'm hitting all my points. So again, with tolerable stress, um, you know, it activates our body's alert system to a greater degree than positive stress might. And um, it, it's time limited. Uh, it's often buffered by relationships and supports. Um, it also can help our brain adapt and recover um, to ameliorate those damaging effects as well. So thinking about uh, jumping to the next level of toxic stress. The difference there is that toxic stress is strong, it's frequent, and it's prolonged. Um, these adversities, these continued experiences this per a person is having when they're continually experiencing toxic stress, um, that adversity is actually changing their baseline stress response rate. Um, uh, you know, an example of this would be someone undergoing abuse. Um, so part of the ACEs study, um, it talked about 10 different areas in particular where the doctors, the original co-principal investigators were really able to make a strong case and connection between the experiences a person was having had earlier on in life and then those negative health and social outcomes. So the 10 areas that they looked at were uh, abuse, that's um, physical, sexual, and emotional, uh, neglect as well, uh, physical neglect and emotional neglect, and then um, a few areas of household dysfunction. And so, for instance, having an individual uh, who is having mental health challenges in the home uh, having someone who's struggling with substance abuse or addiction issues, um, having an incarcerated parent, um, so that criminal activity element, uh, and then having um, separated or divorced parents uh, was another area that was looked at as well. Um, and so what we're doing, um, what the doctors were doing with that study was really taking um, a biological stress uh, measurement, if you will, of this toxic stress that an individual has been exposed to in their lifetime. Now that, that what differentiates this again is that prolonged activation of stress response systems in the absence of protective relationships. So for whatever reason, there aren't those same buffers or protective factors um, for this individual as others may have. Now, again, it's easy to kind of jump to the judgment zone, which is exactly what we're, we're, we're trying to train ourselves not to do in doing this work, right? So oftentimes we'll see behaviors we don't understand, uh, family dynamic or parenting um, that we don't agree with, and um, that judgment creeps in when we say, what is wrong with that person? Why would they do that? We want to move away from that what is wrong with them question instead to what has happened to them that has created these patterns created this way of dealing or coping or responding, um, because oftentimes we'll find that those stories will break our hearts too, right? Well, there's a lot of intergenerational adversity that we're seeing in our families. Oftentimes we learn to parent by the way we are parented, and that's how those cycles get passed on as well. So um, again, I need to pause before I jump too far all over the place with this, but I really wanted us to have a clear understanding of 
of why toxic stress in particular is so damaging, not only emotionally, right, and mentally, but as well as biologically, um, that it really impacts our system because our heart, for instance, is working overtime um, when it's constantly in that stress response zone, constantly in that flip flip zone, right? All of our bodily systems are actually working much harder. Think about the last time that that you had felt scared about something, right? And then uh, like how you felt it through your entire body. Um, so just, uh, I think it's good to have a, an awareness again of what's going on with our, when our, within ourselves as well as with others um, that we may be encountering um, as we walk through our daily lives as well. What we're really getting at and talking about this impact that toxic stress has on, uh, on us during development um, is captured by this um, snippet from the Center on the Developing Child from Harvard University. Uh, and it's this idea here that our behavior, affect, attitude, and capacities may not be choices. They may in fact be normal biological adaptations to toxic stress and adversity during development. So, so often um, I do a lot of work in schools um, and we'll have some really well-meaning educators or uh, you know, say, oh, this student really was giving me a hard time today. And again, language is important, right? And that shift from um, that type of thought to instead of, oh, this child in my classroom was having a really hard time today, right? Um, that idea that that child may in fact not be able to, um, to control some of that to a certain extent, that in, in fact, what our jobs are is building skills through helping those of us who've been through, whether it's a lot of historical trauma or adverse childhood experience, experiences, that toxic stress um, and intergenerational adversity, that sometimes the, the skills that we learn um, to deal with those environments don't serve us well in every environment, right? So part of our charge as, as community members, as families, as individuals who wanna help is also helping give the skills needed for all of us to be successful in whatever environment we find ourselves in. All right, I'm gonna pause for a moment. I realize that um, I've gone in a lot of different directions in, in, in a really short time. Um, I love talking about this stuff and sometimes I um, jump around a little bit because <laughs> I get so excited about all the connections that, that I hear here. So actually what I wanna do is pause really intentionally right now to um, open the floor for any questions anybody may have. Um, up till this point of where we're at together today. So across Minnesota, our organization, and please feel free if you're, you're typing in a question to continue on here um, in writing and posing that. But I wanna give you just a, a quick background. So when we talk about this work, um, we talk about it in terms of NEAR science. So NEAR is an acronym standing for um, neurobiology, epigenetics, adverse childhood experiences, and resiliency. So, so there's a lot of people these days who are talking about ACEs, and I agree it's important. We need to talk about it, but if that's all we're talking about, it's not the whole story, right? We need to understand how our brains are impacted. We need to understand how uh, the experiences of previous generations can affect who we are. Um, we need to understand about that impact of ACEs, most definitely, and the toxic stress that's underlying that, right? And most importantly, we need to make sure we're including conversations about resilience. Um, again, bringing in the, the solution, as well as painting a really clear picture of the problems. Um, I am a strong advocate for prevention work, and that's what I feel like even getting out and doing presentations like this is as well because what we're really trying to do, instead of addressing the symptoms we're seeing in our communities, right, all the hurts, um, we do need to do that. We need people on the ground addressing crises, and we also need to start addressing the root causes of so much of the trauma and pain and cycles we're seeing in our communities today as well, um, too, that can be um, connected back to this larger picture, right, this, this framework of near science. So I touched very briefly on some of the brain science pieces of it so far. Um, so that's the N 
Um, next, we're going to look at the E, the epigenetics piece of it. So does anybody have any ideas about what the two photos on the right hand of the screen um, are of? Go ahead to pop that in the chat box if you have any ideas. The two photos are from Minnesota. And they're actually both photos of uh, American Indian indigenous youth at boarding schools um, here in the state of Minnesota. The top one on the right is uh, uh, White Earth, a boarding school over at White Earth. And the photo on the bottom is uh, the Indian school in Tower, Minnesota. So boarding, the boarding school era is a part of the conversation that we'll talk about today. How um, my ancestors first encounter with the Western educational system was of one that took their babies away uh, and oftentimes never brought them back home. So that boarding school era is so critical to our understanding today of some of the disparities that we're seeing um, in schools um, with our Indigenous students. Um, there's root causes for so many of the things that we're seeing and, and the more that we can dig in to um, finding out tracing back some of these issues, I think then we're going to finally start seeing the results we want to see. And please keep in mind, um, it's not about pointing fingers or placing blame, right? It's about helping dismantle some of the systems and the biases and associations that were put into place um, by things that have happened previously and that um, on an ongoing basis are still hurting all of our people today, no matter what your culture or background. So again, two photos on the right are of boarding school. Uh, the boarding school era here in Minnesota. Then I'll draw your attention to the photo in the center of the screen. It's kind of fuzzy, it's, a, it's an older photo, so it's a little bit hard to, to see quite clearly. Um, but what I am always drawn to when I see this picture is that that face of that baby. <laughs> That's a happy baby. That is a, a baby that feels safe and loved and well cared for, snug on uh, mom's back, right, on a cradle board, which is a traditional way that our Ojibwe women um, would, would tend to their babies. Now, so as much as we're gonna talk about the trauma that's passed down from one generation to the other, where I want our focus to be as well is on the strength that's passed down from one generation to the next as well. The love, the um, tradition, the, those things that make us who we are, that form our identity. Um, we pass that down from one generation to the next as well. And so it, it, as much as, We'll be talking today about that negative impact um, those traumas uh, have caused uh, that ripple through generations. We also need to keep at the forefront um, the positives, right? The, the good things that have taken place and happen as well. Can I ask on all of your screens, um, is my black bar here um, cutting off the screen or can you see the, the total slide? Just want to make sure you're getting it's, the it's coming off a little bit on, on the left hand side. It is okay. Okay, thank you. Let's see if I can figure that out. We will take a break here in a little bit, just a quick kind of bio break, you know, stretch, get some something to drink, um, use the restroom if needed. So uh, in about five minutes here, um, we'll take that break and then that'll give me a chance to to take care of that technical issue as well. So um the next, oh, that's there. There we go. Um, so we're gonna dig into that concept of epigenetics a little bit more with that epigenetic inheritance. So scientists at Emory University had a hypothesis. Um, they conducted an experiment and uh, what they did was they put mice into a cage with a metal bottom uh, and they, then they would infuse the cage with the smell of cherry blossom scent. Each time they would do so, they would also electrify the bottom of the cage, sending mild foot shocks to those mice. What they were doing uh, in, in essence is they were conditioning those mice to fear the smell of cherry blossoms um, by associating it with that very real physical harm, that physical danger of that foot shock. The study, uh, their experiment extended out um, once these mice uh, 
it, their behavior became very evident that they were conditioned to fear that smell. Um, they were taken out of the cage and bred. Um, and I should mention in the original, that original group of mice were all male mice. So those male mice were bred and the resulting pups were then placed in a cage, never having been exposed to any of those elements. However, the very first time um, that they smelled cherry blossoms, even though the danger was no longer present, right? There was no foot shock, uh, no electrifying happening at this point. Those mice pups reacted in, in fear. As soon as they smelled that smell, they would cower in the corner, they would climb up on top of each other. Um, they, they, their biological instinct would kick in that they needed, um, that there was danger. Okay, and that experiment actually extended out another generation. So again, these pups were never exposed to those conditions, but then when they were bred and had pups of their own, their pups exhibited the same behavior. In fact, um, when they looked at, uh, into this a little bit further, they found that the mice actually had more cherry blossom detecting neurons in their noses and more brain space devoted to cherry blossom smelling. Now, why might this be? What it all comes back down to is survival, right? So the ability, ability to be able to pass down from one generation to another information that could lend to um, them avoiding danger um, might be helpful, right? So what happened, their, the DNA itself wasn't changed, right? So this process of epigenetic inheritance, what it actually um, is doing is placing genetic markers um, that are influencing then how the genome is read. Ultimately, what this proved um, is that traumatic experiences are transmitted across generations. Um, prior to this, um, the general um, thought process was that you're kind of born with a blank slate. Um, however, what this study and then many other subsequent studies um, have shown was that in fact, um, our environment, our experiences, um, things that are happening around us are at times leaving those uh, epigenetic markers uh, on our DNA. So think of it kind of as a light switch being turned on or off, um, determining whether or not that gene will be expressed, okay? So long story short, um, I realized this was about mice, right? This, this uh, mice and cherry blossom study. However, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, we have many, uh, indicators, many events throughout human history as well, where um, similar patterns can be detected. So um, we're going to transition now to talking about historical trauma. Specifically, I'm checking the time here. I'm going to probably go for about another five minutes and then we'll take a short break. I um, just want to make sure I'm giving people time to stretch because again, this is a long time to sit and listen. So um historical trauma so can i have you do the the next poll um regarding kind of how familiar folks are about these topics please you should be able to click on the poll to be able to enter thank you Now, of course, today um, I am sharing from the perspective. Okay, great. Good. This makes me happy. I see that that almost everybody has heard of it before. Um, again, today, you know, I'll be focusing in and sharing specifically on the impact um, that historical trauma has had on our Indigenous communities. However, we do want to note uh, and, and uh, make the connections uh, in our minds um, about how other groups have been impacted as well. So the term historical trauma itself was first coined by Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart. Um, and she really, she's a Lakota woman, and she was really wanting to explore how her own community has been impacted by the history, uh, our, our community's history and our ancestors' history. So, uh, you, know, so you see in the first picture there, uh, a Lakota mother and child, I'm sorry, it's a Cheyenne woman uh, and child. Um, again, Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart is Lakota, and that was her initial intent was to study her own community. In the center there, we also see um, a, a photo of a plantation uh, in Georgia. 
And so we also know how that our Black and African American communities have been impacted um, by things that have happened historically in this country and before the founding as well. Um, and then on the far side of the screen, you'll see uh, prisoners in the concentration camp in Germany, right? So thinking about the impact that um, Nazi Holocaust survivors and descendants, um, how they've been impacted by historical trauma as well. And those are just a few examples, right? I can think of many contemporary issues also um, that we could be studying through this lens from refugees and immigrants and, you know, those running from war-torn countries and uh, and you know, there's so many correlations that um, can be made to things happening today. So I will take a pause to make that note as well, right? We call it historical trauma, um, and that tends to make us think that it, we're talking about things that happened only hundreds of years ago. And certainly that's part of it, right? However, what we need to realize is that historical trauma is still happening today. It's still impacting our communities. Um, it, it's manifesting itself uh, in ways that we might not even see for generations to come, right? When we, when we learn uh, how this current situation, the pandemic is impacting us um, as individuals, families, communities, nations, worldwide, right? So, so we have a lot to pay attention to and a lot to learn from, even with things that are happening around us today uh, in reference to the topics we're talking about. So this is the official um, definition posited by Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart. She calls it the cumulative emotional and psychological wounding over the lifespan and across generations, emanating from massive group trauma. She goes on to explain that the historical trauma response is a constellation of features in reaction to massive group trauma. The response is observed among Lakota and other native populations, Jewish Holocaust survivors and descendants, uh, Japanese American internment camp survivors and descendants as well. So why do we talk about historical trauma? Uh, Yellow Horse Braveheart was also very clear about outlining her intention in doing this work. Um, the last thing that anybody wanted um, was for it to be taken the wrong way. You know, when I approach a subject, depending on um, the company I'm in, um, the reason why folks attend the presentation that I'm giving, um, so on and so forth, I really receive a mixed response as well. You know, sometimes people will say, um, get over it, just get over it. Why are you still talking about that? Quit staying stuck in the past. You know, all of those things. And I've heard them to both to my face as well as through other means. So again, I wanna be really clear about why I'm doing this work, why Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart did it in the first place. And it's really to begin a healing process. It's about moving forward, not about staying stuck in the past. Uh, and in, or in doing so, um, an important piece of that is reclaiming traditional cultural protective factors. Um, being in community, um, you know, different healing practices that have been used traditionally, um, the importance of connection and family. Um, so much of that is interwoven into many of our indigenous histories. And that's part of what makes us strong, that strong community, culture, spirituality um, connection as well. Um, again, Yellow Horse Braveheart said, it's also to stop identifying ourselves as victims and to move from identifying merely as survivors instead to transcending and thriving, right? So just merely surviving isn't enough. Everybody deserves that really full um, opportunity to transcend, right, the things that have happened to us um, and instead move into that thriving, uh, empowered life as well. All right, so this is a perfect opportunity for us to take a break, um, just a short break for everybody to get up and stretch, for me to get some water and rest my voice for a minute. Uh, when we come back, we will be watching uh, a short video. Um, and so my time says 1.50. Um, do you think a five minute break is okay. adequate? Okay, great. So we'll come back at 155. Thanks, everybody.
All right, looks like we're right back on about five minutes. Just a moment and we'll get started again. All right, um, we're gonna get started back up and we're actually gonna open with a video. So, um, what do I wanna say here? I want to point out um, that the following video we're gonna watch can be really powerful and um, it doesn't tell the whole story, right? Um, however, part of what this work, part of what the impact of historical trauma has had on our communities um, is a perceived, a very real, um, and in ways perceived loss of agency, loss of voice, loss of telling our own stories, right? Again, the difference between reading a history book that tells um, one side versus a more complete view um, that I was advocating for at my school um, when I was growing up, okay? So I'll just, leave, I'll leave it there. Um, this video is a response that's put together by youth, um, and we'll, we'll We'll talk a little bit more about my reasoning for showing it in a moment here. So, does this sound good for people? One morning I woke up. He was screaming so loud, he thought someone was dying. Mom, Dad, he screamed, but there was no use trying. They weren't around. I ran outside and saw he'd had a pretty bad crash. His bike was in the ditch, down his arm a bloody gash. He looked so pitiful just sitting there in the dirt amongst the trash crying. I want Mom and Dad was in the ditch, down his arm a bloody gash. He looked so pitiful just sitting there in the dirt amongst the trash crying, I want mom and dad. I picked him up and started running toward my uncles up the way. It started raining and got real dark, he could barely tell it was day. My brother cried and asked, sister, where's mom? I didn't know what to say when the truth is, I don't know. When my uncle saw us coming, he ran into the yard. He took my brother from me and he held him in his arms. When he saw my face, I could tell. I could tell he was alarmed. And he said, what happened? Did you fall too? Uncle, I'm so tired, so tired of wondering why. Why do they drink? Why do they do drugs? Why do they leave us? Why? He said, sister, it's hard to explain. And I said, uncle, try. And then he told this story. Once this land was teepees as far as you can see. The water was clean, the land pristine. We were where we were meant to be. Then strangers came across the sea and brought with them their disease. Our people cried and prayed and sang, but it brought them to their knees. Imagine that your family, and most of all your tribe, what if most of everyone you love suddenly got sick and died? And before you even had a chance to bury them and mourn, the strangers came and took away the land where you were born. And you wondered if your parents even cared as they stole you and your brother away, or if they'd been so beaten down they had nothing left to say. 
And then at school, they cut your hair and beat you if you spoke. The language that Creator gave our people when Earth awoke. trying to tell you that your mom and dad are okay or that they are not responsible for the choices that they've made but you see this bloody wound on your little brother's arm if we don't clean it it won't heal and it'll do all kinds of harm those deep wounds of our ancestors still bleed within our hearts when we remember all they've done that's where the healing starts so every morning when you wake you pray this prayer out loud Creator, help me live in a way that would make my ancestors proud. We will rise from the darkness. Don't you forget this. You can be anything you want to be. We will overcome the pain. Just work hard. Never give up. Perseverance is the key. For your spirits live within. Strength, dignity. That's all in your family tree, so hold your head up high and know that. reactions after seeing that video. So the video, um, it's called We Shall Remain um, by the Style Horse Collective. Uh, as it was created to address the effects of historical trauma in our tribal communities. Many times these untended wounds are at the core of much of the self-inflicted pain experienced in Native America. Much like fire, this pain can either be devastatingly destructive or wisely harnessed to become fuel that helps us to rise up and move forward in life with joy, purpose, and dignity. So I mentioned previously that this video was made by youth um, to tell their story, right? Of how they experience or see historical trauma um, playing out in their communities. Uh, and then again, as it says here, understanding that it can be harnessed um, to, to move forward in a good way. Did anything surprise you that you saw in the video? Um, was it a new information or, or a lot of things that you were already or were aware of? Like I said, I'm so used to doing this in person and really having that element of interaction. Um, 
this is new. This is a different experience for me. So please don't be shy, folks. If you have questions, if I need to slow down, if something isn't connecting or making sense, um, I'm here to help all of us learn together uh, in this time today. So please feel free to pop questions in at any time to, to make comments in the chat box. Um, part of learning, right, is being uh, very active in it. All right, so um, I mentioned around the video um, that is part of the story and it isn't the whole story. You know, the reason why I put it that way, I believe it is an amazing um, way to start approaching a very difficult subject. Uh, I think it's empowering that the youth chose to put their time and effort into something like that. Um, and I would, proceed a little bit with caution in showing that video um, without accompanying it with the discussion around um, helping debrief it and understand it a little bit more as well. Um, I think there are maybe some negative stereotypes that could be reinforced if the larger picture isn't being looked at of, of what um, the video was trying to illustrate in a short period of time, right? We know our Indigenous communities do struggle with substance abuse with um, issues within the family, those types of things. And, and that's a real, very real valid concern. And I think it's important um, to do what the video is suggesting and that we look at the root cause of so many of the issues we're seeing in our communities today and really start that practice of healing um, and transcending um, out of those struggles. That being said, um, I think it's a good way again of introducing um, this massive topic. Um, that we're going to talk about today. So when Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart um, first studied how historical trauma impacts Indigenous communities, um, there were several eras in particular that she highlighted in our uh, history, uh, our nation's history, well even pre, pre our nation's history, right, the history of this land, I guess I should say. So we're going to walk through those, those pieces to kind of get filled in a little bit more on what the Indigenous experience has been uh, in our country, in our state, um, and so we know that the first era that we're going to talk about is first contact. Um, there was warfare uh, and attempted genocide that really took place during that time. However, upon first contact as well, um, one of the most detrimental pieces um, surrounding that era was uh, the introduction of over 20 diseases from the Eastern Hemisphere. Uh, you know, everything from tall, the smallpox to typhus to the measles. Um, since our communities had never been exposed to those things before, that also meant that we didn't have immunity to them. Um, and, you know, at times entire villages uh, were lost. So those significant losses that were taking place just because of the disease um, resulting out of those various epidemics that our communities were dealing with upon first contact. Um, I should pause here for a minute and, and recognize Right, we know that uh, indigenous communities that are living in what is now known as the United States, um, uh, there's over 500 federally recognized tribes. We know that uh, although there are a lot of uh, similarities, that there's differences too. You know, most um, have different languages and customs, um, territories, culture. Um, however, what we do want to acknowledge here is that the vast majority also share a common history post-contact of broken treaties, genocide, assimilation and acculturation, uh, racism, and discrimination. So again, I started here with talking about the epidem epidemics that took place upon first contact, um, as well as the warfare that took place um, upon first contact. Um, you know, I have uh, date after date and number after number I could read off, you know, everything from uh, the, you know, 1849 gold rush massacres in California, uh, over 100,000 dead from disease, malnourishment, enslavement, with over 4,500 of those deaths murder. Um, we know that there was the Sand Creek Massacre of 1864 resulting in the murder of 163 unarmed elderly men, women, and children. So again, the unarmed elderly men, women, and children. And that's why, rather than calling it warfare, um, 
I would more aptly describe it as attempted genocide. Um, oftentimes there was no um, rhyme or reason behind these villages being attacked other than xenophobia, right? Fear of the unknown. Um, and oftentimes these villages were attacked when the men were away, whether it was for a hunting party or, or if they were going to scout out. Um, oftentimes a lot of these villages would be attacked when the most vulnerable were left back at home. Um, one thing I wanna mention here too, is I can certainly rattle off dates and numbers and, and, and those types of things. Um, and you know, we can read black and white text in a history book um, about some of these things happening. However, what I am encouraging folks to do as we walk through this together is to think about what that very personal human experience would have been like. Um, even starting at the beginning, right, with first contact, imagine being a child living at that time, seeing these strangers moving in, knowing or sensing that your parents or others in the village were, were a little bit frightened or taken aback. Um, thinking about your family falling sick, right? Being a young person and, and, you know, it said that sometimes entire villages were wiped out by these diseases spreading across them. What would have that felt like as a child? Seeing that fight, fight or fright, uh, <laughs> well, fight or fight, flight instinct would be kicking in, um, that toxic stress. Um, so those are just things to keep in mind because again, we can read these things in a history book, but what we really need to do is put the human face on it. Think about what it would have been like to be a child living at that time. As we moved more into the era of the villages being attacked while the men uh, warriors were away as well, what would that have felt like? Imagine being a mother and living in constant fear of, am I gonna be able to protect my babies when dad's out hunting and these strangers come in and start trying to you know, pillage our villages. What would that have felt like? The next era that Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart talks about <laughs> included um, moving into the era of uh, removal and relocation. So federal Indian policy uh, in included the re removal and relocation of natives west of the Mississippi, as well as onto reservations. Um, a well-known example of this, right, is the Trail of Tears. I remember reading about that in my history books, most definitely. Um, and that was a result of the Indian Removal Act of 1830, including what was termed the five civilized tribes. Keep in mind that these tribes were the ones who were accommodating the U.S. government. They were trying to work together um, because they wanted to ensure that their people would be protected. So when the government insisted that people be farmers, they took up farming right away. When um, some of those other uh, ideals were being pushed upon our indigenous communities. Um, these tribes tended to want to cooperate and to work together in order to make that happen. And yet, as we see what took place during the Trail of Tears, um, even in that spirit of cooperation, they still uh, were treated horribly. So the Trail of Tears itself included the Cherokee, Choctaw, Seminole, Chickasaw, and Creek tribes. And I've read a, an account of a, an elder that has now passed, um, but that talked about, um, recorded some of his thoughts as an eight-year-old being part of that um, mass exodus that took place during the Trail of Tears, where all these tribes were being moved to, to less desirable land, right, for control and subjugation. And, and so those resources could be taken by others as well. He um, recounted how devastating it was to watch children, um, babies, as well as elderly being left behind, or even worse, um, being killed in front of their parents, in front of their family members, because they were slowing down um, the march. So, you know, there's many stories like that, and it's heartbreaking. And again, that puts that human face on it, you know, to really think about what that would have been like to live during that time, what that would have felt like, you know, all those sensations. Um, so I also want to mention that here in Minnesota, the original plan um, was to put all uh, indigenous communities living within the borders into one reservation. It originally started at Leech Lake, but then they decided they were going to use White Earth instead. Now, we live in Minnesota, and Minnesota is vastly different from one border to the next, isn't it? When you think about where all the beautiful area all of you live in, um, and then way down to the southern part of the state, you know, rolling farmland. 
um, even in my area, you know, our terrain is different than yours. Um, and the, the idea as well, that here in Minnesota, um, we obviously, you know, there's 11 uh, tribal nations now um, that have a land base here. And they're also, they're not all Ojibwe, right? We know that there's some Dakota, uh, Lakota, Nakota uh, brothers and sisters, neighbors that live, uh, uh, that share land here as well. In fact, we know that the Ojibwe and uh, Lakota don't traditionally get along very well, right? Because there were clashes over land, over territory, right here in the state of Minnesota even also. So this idea that they were gonna take 11 different communities and move them all onto one small tract of land here in Minnesota ignored completely our normal subsistence patterns, right? So even to this day, my brother takes time off of work, off of his full-time job to go uh, out uh, on the lake for wild racing in the fall. It's such an important staple, not only connection to uh, community, to culture, but as well as a very real thing that our people still depend on today for their livelihood and for feeding your family through the winter. Okay, so imagine being an Ojibwe family, you know where the good wild rice beds are on the lake that you live on. You know um, the patterns of the, the uh, deer, the deer migration and stuff. You know how to track the, you know, the wildlife that you need to, to feed your family. You know very likely where the best maple sugaring is, where the best uh, berries are for picking, all of those things, right? Because you're familiar with your land. So what would it have been like to be a family who knew how to take care of yourself, of your kids, and then to be told that you're gonna be moved arbitrarily hundreds of miles away to this land that you've never seen before. What would that have felt like? <laughs> um, you know, as we know now, that plan did not take place, that ultimate plan of moving all of our tribal nations into one area. However, individual reservations were established at this time. So even that, even say, yes, you get to stay in the land you're familiar with, but what happens when someone tells you there's this imaginary boundary that you can't cross because then you'd be off the reservation, right? And then, then you know, your life would be in danger, essentially. What would that have felt like? <laughs> so again, as you can tell, um, my continued call to action for all of us throughout this work is to, again, put that human face on the experiences that we read about in history books, that we read about, you know, in the newspaper, to really think about what it would be, be like to be experiencing that to think about that impact that would be having on our body systems, our stress response system, that baseline stress response that keeps coming at a higher and higher uh, alert because of having to deal with constant danger around the next corner. When we think about that, about what we know now that Western science is able to tell us, uh, it correlates really well with a lot of what indigenous knowledge has always known. We've always known this idea of blood memory, right? Or of soul wound, or this historical trauma about how uh, we're impacted by what's happened to generations that have come before us and we impact the generations that come after us. So again, <laughs> that is our, our repeated call of action is to really think about things through that lens. As we continue to talk about these different eras that uh, indigenous communities uh, and all communities have been impacted by uh, here in Minnesota and beyond. Check my notes. So to give you a sense of how detrimental war, disease, removal, and relocation were on our indigenous populations in the continental U.S., um, the numbers pre-contact were estimated to be somewhere between 5 and 18 million. I realize that's a big range. However, we didn't have census takers like we do today. Um, even if you go at the low end of that estimate though, five million. I've actually heard uh, as high as 23 million as well on the other end of it. So five to 23 million uh, indigenous peoples living here pre-contact. Well, by 1900, numbers were hovering around 250,000. Can you believe that? between five and 18 million to 250,000 because of the impact of d disease introduction of the, the warfare that took place, um, you know, so uh, of the, the stressors of, of removal and relocation, um, so many of those things 
um, that it impacted our populations at that time. But that really gives you a sense for how devastating our nation's story really is in terms of the treatment of um, our indigenous communities and that um, such an opportunity for bridge, bridge building existed uh, and happened in pockets most definitely. Um, however, as you'll see, um, the federal policy, federal government really adopted this policy of looking at our communities as the problem, right? The Indian problem is referenced in so many historical documents and it really encapsulates how our people were thought about and how we were dealt with um, throughout this time because of that as well. So I talked a little bit about conditions on or about the reservation system um, and I want to touch a little bit more on what those conditions on the reservation were like. So we know that <clears throat> that the main reason for placing us on to reservations um, was about control and subjugation. And it was very hard for colonizers to understand or to grasp how many of our communities didn't have the concept of individual ownership. Um, part of what the assimilation process included was this real urging um, to have us split into nuclear family groups versus kind of our extended family systems we were often used to living with um, into the nuclear family group and to be able to uh, take up farming rather than our traditional patterns of providing for our families through hunting and gathering. Um, it was such a, a conflict, I feel like, on a worldview level um, that it even, it perpetuated or exacerbated, you know, the divide between us as well. People felt that we were savage uh, because we didn't adhere to many of the principles and values that uh, settlers uh, held high, right, about that individual ownership piece. You know, the fact that, you know, we respected the, uh, the land and the resources and the environment and often would move camp depending on season um, that we would um, really exemplify that environmental stewardship. Um, all of that was, was in contrast to, to what others felt that uh, was important. That being said, um, a very common stereotype or point of discrimination that I hear in my community is the idea of the welfare Indian or the idea of the Indian who's sits with their hand out waiting for the government to give them something. Now this is hurtful on many levels, right? There's many of us who depend on um, different supports as we're struggling through things and getting on our feet. Um, and we certainly aren't all indigenous. However, that is a stereotype I've heard before. And I wonder how many people are aware that part of the federal government's ways of dealing with the Indian problem, so to speak, was to create forced dependence on the government through the reservation system. Um, so the reservation system, again, um, said that, you know, folks had to live within these boundaries. They couldn't leave. Um, and so what that meant was that oftentimes many in our communities uh, would find themselves very hungry because they weren't able to serve, provide for themselves in the same way they were used to in terms of hunting, gathering, so on and so forth. So in exchange for the tracts of land, that um, those contracts uh, called treaties um, put into to action, uh, oftentimes the government would, would exchange, would promise to our communities that we would be provided with food and rations and annuities and um, those different things coming from the government as an exchange for that resource. So uh, Indian agents were placed um, as kind of uh, the conduit between the government and the Indian villages. Uh, oftentimes these people were very corrupt. So while we waited for these promised rations to come through, um, by the time they got to us, oftentimes um, they were uh, divvied up to, to other people who were not part of our communities. Or once they arrived, sometimes um, the food would be spoiled. <laughs> Um, there were many things that happened in terms of conditions on reservations. 
um, having to do with, with this conversation. So the other thing that I want to be sure to touch on is how, again, that forced dependence on the government, right, for providing, um, that really had roots right here in this era. And I want us to keep that in mind um, because I'm not sure that, that the policies and the treaties and those types of things are fully understood. So keep in mind a treaty, a treaty, the reason why our indigenous communities are able to make treaties is because we're on a nation to nation basis with the federal government. Um, we're sovereign tribal nations, meaning that those treaties were contracts essentially signed by, between two nations. Um, and so oftentimes, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about treaties as well, um, and about so-called government handouts. Um, when in fact, in addition to the food and the, the other um, necessary supplies that the government promised us, they also promised many um, to take care of healthcare needs. And you see today in our country, we have the Federal, Federal Indian Health Service, right? Um, and oftentimes that's misunderstood too about where that came from. Um, and so again, my repeated message today is it's so important for us to know our history. So then we can really have a clear view of contemporary things um, that people may not understand because of not knowing um, the origins. So conditions on reservations ended up getting so bad um, that by the time this next era rolled around, oh, I'm gonna skip it forward. The boarding school era, we're gonna talk about in just a moment. So keep in mind what these conditions on the reservations were like. Um, and that foreshadows kind of uh, something else we're gonna talk about here. I wanna make sure I touch on this as well. Um, removal of food sources, um, destruction of flora and fauna, so to speak, is another era that Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart addresses as being very impactful in terms of um, the detrimental effect on our communities. So does anybody know what the photo depicts? There's a man standing down at the bottom, as well as one standing up at the top of that pile. And what that is, is bison, skulls, just the skulls. So buffalo skulls, um, not even the whole animal. Um, and again, you can see the, the size comparison, right, with the, the man standing at the bottom and at the top. Now, it's very interesting to me that, you know, all the information I've shared with you so far today, um, I've been, been very, um, careful and making sure that I can cite all my sources, right? So at the end of the presentation as well, um, if there's additional um, research that you wanna do, um, I'll make sure to, to, that you all get receive a PDF too of this so you can kind of look into it more on your own. And that's important because so often I think some of this is considered conjecture when in fact it's well documented. So the quote I have on the screen is General Philip Sheridan um, and this was uh, published, it was a part of a speech that he did. Um, and you can see the citation there about the publication it was included in. But he says this, these men have done more in the last two years and will do more in the next year to settle the vexed Indian question than the entire regular army has done in the last 40 years. They are destroying the Indians commissary and it is a well-known fact that an army losing its base of supplies is placed at a great disadvantage. Send them powder and lead, if you will, but for a lasting peace, let them kill, skin, and sell until all the buffaloes are exterminated. Then your prairies can be covered with speckled cattle. So the army knew that our Lakota, Dakota, Nakota neighbors, you know, our Plains tribe, tribes, um, really depended upon the buffalo for a number of reasons. Not only was it a food source, it also held great spiritual significance. Um, there are many medicines that came from the buffalo. Their, uh, also, uh, their hides were used for shelter uh, and clothing. Um, every piece of that animal uh, held an important um, piece of um, the, the, those tribes' uh, well-being, right, in one way or another. And so as Sheridan says here, um, the removal of the buffalo from the plains was done very intentionally. Now I do want to acknowledge, we also know westward expansion was taking place, right? The railroad was crossing to the coast. And so of course, 
um, buffalo on the tracks would also provide a problem, right? So the clearing of the plains of the buffalo had a couple of reasons, but as you see on the screen, it also was explicitly used as another means of control, control and subjugation um, over native people. So to give you an idea as well of how detrimental um, this was, uh, the prime example is the near elimination of the Plains Buffalo. Um, they estimated prior to 1800 that there was about 60 million buffalo roaming the plains. And then by 1895, um, they were down to an all-time low of less than 1,000 left. So from 60 million to less than 1,000 buffalo remaining. And of course, we do know that there's a variety of reasons, as I mentioned, in addition to westward expansion, um, the economic value of buffalo hides. Um, but again, it was used to clear the plains from both the buffalo and the Indian populations for westward expansion. Uh, the result of this decimation of the buffalo was the widespread starvation, as well as social and cultural collapses of many plains tribes, particularly the, the Sioux, the Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota tribes. So again, um, there's so many pieces of our history um, that, that's rooted in, in the, these types of things. Let me clarify. I should also say that I think I can think of contemporary examples um, that have had similar results um, on our people. When I think of a lot of the environmental struggles that are happening right now, um, that's what I think of. When I think about here in Minnesota, the uh, um, wild race, uh, genome was going to be mapped and then modified. They wanted to genetically modify wild rice. Um, this was back when I was in college and I remember, you know, being part of a big organized protest to that because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, wild rice remains such an important economic and cultural staple in our communities. And the idea that, that they were going to mess with nature, right? Um, and once you do something like that, you're, the, the Pandora's box is open, right? Their idea was that they were gonna have um, separate uh, controlled wild rice beds that were genetically modified. However, we know, you know, between nature, <laughs> wind, all those other things, um, there was a lot of danger in that to contaminating our wild rice bed beds um, with this modified um, genetic code. So anyhow, um, again, there are many contemporary examples um, I'm curious if anybody can think of any others. I think of a story from the Pacific Northwest about salmon and salmon being such a, an important, important staple of the diet of the indigenous communities there uh, and how, you know, with the different dams that were built, so on and so forth, it was really impacting um, the livelihood of that tribe, both historically as well as contemporarily um, because of that also. I see one of the the, <laughs> the comments is, is something that I, I would agree is impacting too with the pipelines. Um, now, please understand and know my heart, and it, this is not to, to raise controversy, but it is to give perspective, right? Um, pipelines have been detrimental to our communities, not only by the impact to the environment, um, our water supply, um, as well as the increased violence against Native women um, that takes place uh, when man camps are, are set up as well. We have so many, so many unfortunate examples of that, and the statistics are so daunting, right? At the beginning of the month, there was a Wear Red Day for awareness of murdering and mis murdered and missing Indigenous women. You know, the statistics are staggering when we think about how disproportionately uh, our, our women are impacted um, by violence and and aggression in those ways too. Yes, thank you. Another example, oil and mineral rights in Alaska, clean water advocacy in Minnesota, um, spear fishing in Wisconsin, right? There, there are so many examples. I just read an article, a news story um, within the last month or so where um, people, a, a disgruntled, Wisconsin man was shooting at a group of native people exercising their treaty rights who were spearfishing. So again, we know that, you know, this really rose to controversy in the 80s. It's not over. You know, people are still very upset to the point of, you know, being willing to 
to shoot at a group of another human beings over these issues. So again, all this to say, we need to keep the perspective and the lens of what's happening contemporarily as well, and what impact that's having on our communities today, as well as the impact it's going to have uh, in, in years to come on our people. All right, this is moving into now the boarding school era. I do want to say I was foreshadowing it a little bit earlier with the conditions on the reservations. Now, when this idea first came about, this idea of opening boarding schools, uh, assimilating our native kids one generation at a time, the parents that were first approached about this opportunity volunteered to send their children because they knew their kids at home with them on, on these reservations were oftentimes starving. Right, so the government promised that we'll take your children to the sporting school, they'll learn how to survive, the, you know, the Western education system, how to survive in this new world that's coming. Um, we'll make sure that to feed and clothe them, you know, teach them these skills. So at first, because of the conditions on the reservations were so poor, families were, were happy to send their kids somewhere where they were told, were told that they'd be taken care of. Unfortunately, um, oftentimes there were cemeteries out back of these boarding schools because many, many of these children never saw their parents again. So I'll pause there and give you a little bit of background on this. Um, Colonel Richard H. Pratt is a staunch 19th century assimilationist, and he was considered kind of the father of the boarding school era. He says this, a great general has said that the only good Indian is a dead one, and that high sanction of his, destru of his destruction has been an enormous factor in promoting Indian massacres. In a sense, I agree with this sentiment, but only in this, that all the Indian there is in the race should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. So this was federal Indian, or federal national policy uh, explicitly stated and how our government was dealing with the vexed Indian question, okay? Again, I like to point that out because I think sometimes people don't realize this is not conjecture. It was stated policy that, to, that the goal of these boarding schools, the very first interaction many of our families had with the Western educational system was the system that outright was created to kill the Indian and save the man. Um, I can't emphasize how important it is that we acknowledge and understand that. So the two photos here on the screen, the top is a group of kids as they entered the boarding school. Um, you can see they, you know, came in a uh, fairly traditional dress, so many had long hair. Um, the photo on the bottom is the same group after they were given a Western uniform style of dress after their hair was cut um, after they'd been in the boarding school for some time. So the boarding school era began uh, around uh, 1879 with the first off-reservation boarding school being built in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Uh, and the era continued well past 1930s, in fact, into the 50s, although it changed form somewhat as moving away from a governmentally instituted place, um, exchanged hands a number of times uh, in forms. In fact, I should mention that University of Minnesota Morris, where I attended undergraduate school at, actually uh, was a, an Indian boarding school um, operated by the Sisters of Mercy. Um, when the Sisters of Mercy handed control of the, the buildings, the institution, over to the government um, to become an agricultural school, one of the things that they made uh, sure to put in the contract was that no American Indian student should ever have to pay tuition there as kind of a uh, uh, what's the word, um, restitution, so to speak, um, for what had happened there in the boarding school years. So that was actually one of the reasons why I attended the University of Minnesota Morris. Um, tuition, the tuition waiver was great, but even larger was that acknowledgement um, that of the, the negative impact that the boarding school era had on our, on our communities. Um, and so that was a draw for me. Um, it was almost a moment of empowerment to be able to go and learn in this place voluntarily by uh, when I know that um, knew its history. All right, so the boarding school era 
Um, the intent of the schools was to assimilate Native American people one generation at a time uh, and destroy the social and familial bonds that gave the tribes their strong sense of identity and pride. Um, the social fabric of many tribes in North America was built on relational ties and established tribal structures, such as the clan system in the Ojibwe that I mentioned earlier, um, as well as the deeply ingrained traditions and ceremonies that were really a way of teaching value, of culture, of life. During the assimilation era, uh, coercion was commonly used in the recruitment of the early boarding school students. So I mentioned in the beginning, you know, parents wanting to send their kids. Then they began to realize that their children would be sent hundreds of miles away, oftentimes the, the further the better, so as to discourage families from coming to visit, as well as to discourage the children from running away to try to escape back home. Um, once parents began realizing this, began realizing that oftentimes the, the kids wouldn't even get to come home for breaks, um, then there started to be a lot of hesitation in sending their children off. Uh, stories also were felt during home about the loneliness there, about the cold institutional way that they were treated. Um, oftentimes, corporal punishment was commonplace. Um, so in 1907, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs endorsed the use of force when families did not voluntarily enroll their children. So this could include the sh shooting or killing of the parent or the child if the parent didn't voluntarily allow their child um, to go with the Indian agent who came to take them. So again, what would that feel like as a child? What would it feel like to have the stranger come and, and, and rip you out of your mother's arms, right? And bring you to this place hundreds of miles from home where then you were punished for speaking your language, which, which was the only language that you knew. Imagine how terrifying that would be. Imagine what it would have felt like to be a mother or a father being put in that position. Um, after, once the boarding school era began, we really also began to see an uptick in substance abuse problems with the, the parents left back home. Uh, in many of our cultures, our children are sacred. Um, they're a reason for being. So um, just that devastation that it wrought back home on in our tribal communities um, with missing these children, missing our purpose in life. And, and raising these little beings, um, it was devastating on so many levels to our people. Um, so children as young as four years old were, were taken from their parents during this time. Um, as I mentioned, my littlest is almost four, and I cannot imagine what that would feel like. Uh, he's still such a baby in so many ways, you know, and again, I, uh, I just think about that horror, that trauma, that pain that was inflicted on both sides, the families as well as, as the children as they were taken and put into these institutions. Now, I want to also point out, I don't believe for a minute that every single person who worked in a boarding school uh, did so with ill intent. In fact, this was accepted federal national policy. What many of these people felt they were doing was what would save you know, these kids from their Indian savagery. Um, and so uh, it's more important than ever that we constantly hold ourselves accountable as well. I think being constantly questioning of, is the, the intention that I'm putting forth, right? The intention to help these people having the same impact on them as I want it to. So just important things to keep in mind um, when we think about this work. So I mentioned um, corporal punishment was commonplace in the boarding schools, as well as other abuses and neglect. Uh, many Native children attending boarding schools experienced attacks against their physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual development and well-being. Um, we know that there's tales of sexual abuse happening in boarding schools as well. Um, students in the boarding schools were um, used as cheap labor to run the schools. Uh, the schools were often underfunded. Children went without adequate food, shelter, clothing, and medical treatment. Um, I should mention that um, an important piece of, of understanding the, the impact, the real impact that this has had in that, that tear of our social fabric, so to speak, 
um, how, how do most of us learn how to parent? Generally, by how we are parented ourselves, right? So what does it mean for whole generations that were taken away from their families and raised in these cold institutions and um, you know, that inability of our native parents to pass along cultural knowledge and teaching and language to their children, you know, just that disintegration and those strong cultural protective factors, right, that uh, lends itself so much to growing stronger and more resilient. So having that taken away um, was detrimental too, especially to whole generations full of, of kids and parents. You know, right now in my community, there are many, many grandparents and great grandparents currently raising babies um, of their children or grandchildren. And I believe that, th that those cycles that, uh, that started here still have not been interrupted. Um, oftentimes through the trials and hardships and the overcoming in life, um, we see people, generations coming back around, right? That's why we have grandparents and great grandparents raising their babies because they're, they're grandbabies because they've done their healing work. You know, and oftentimes many of those intergenerational cycles, um, we're not doing enough to interrupt those, I guess is how I would summarize it. Um, any other thoughts, any other questions regarding the boarding school era? That's a very small, shortened version of, uh, again, a very large topic. But I'm always interested in hearing, um, you know, thoughts and experience and expertise from others in the room. So please, again, feel free to add anything to the chat box if you have any questions about anything we've talked about so far or have any, anything to add, you're welcome that. So following the boarding school era, <clears throat> Um, there are actually, how many people have heard of the Miriam Report? Um, there was a uh, findings finally put out widely um, regarding the gross abuses and neglect and um, the, the dismal conditions that um, were happening in boarding schools. Um, and so the government decided to shift their focus, although assimilation can continue to be the goal. And that moves us into the adoption and foster care eras. The Indian Adoption Project was a federal program and acquired children from 1958 to 1967 involving the Child Welfare League of America as well as churches. According to a report by the Association of American Indian Affairs, as many as one third of Native children were separated from their families between 1941 and 1967. During this era, almost any issue from minor to serious could precipitate the loss of a child from the home. And oftentimes there was no home study or comparable investigation necessary to support these removals. Uh, as in the case of one adoptee, uh, she recounts that she was snatched up as a toddler from her family's yard in South Dakota by a social worker in a black car. Her family had no way of knowing where she was taken or why. And that's, um, Sandy Whitehawk, uh, a colleague of mine uh, who lives in the metro area and is the founder of the First Nations Repatriation Institute. Uh, it's an organization she established um, being someone who was adopted during this era outside of her um, culture. Um, her institution helps reunite um, our native uh, family relatives who'd been adopted outside of the culture and helps welcome them back in. Um, it's really interesting work. There's a documentary that has been made um, about the, some of the ceremonies and work that she does. It's called Blood Memory. Um, I'd encourage you to look that up if that is of interest to you, as well as the First Nations Repatriation Institute. There's lots of great information and Sandy is a great person to connect with around these issues. All right, so Children that, of children that were removed from their families during this time period, 85% of those children were placed in non-native homes or institutions. So assimilation continued to be the goal. 
Now, what's important for us to understand here is that um, this was a very subjective era. So many of the things that made our, that we feel make our our families strong, such as like the extended family system, right? Uh, oftentimes I have nieces and nephews and cousins and uh, a grandparent or an aunt that, that will be um, at my home at any given time as well. And during this era, um, oftentimes such family arrangements were considered to be neglectful. Um, you know, they have 10 people living in a one bedroom house. Well, they're not taking adequate care of their children. When in fact, in many of our communities, we see that as a strength, right? Being surrounded by family, being surrounded by other caregivers. Um, That's just one example of, of ways that uh, there's been a clash in not understanding each other culturally, right? Um, again, just as much like I mentioned with the educational system and with those people who are working in it, I also don't believe that you know every social worker um, who played a part in this era was doing it with ill intent. Because again, it's a sign of the times when you're being told that this is what's best for the child, um, especially if you're being told that by the government and by those that you know are in authority over you. Um, it, it's understandable why we saw such such disparities start to emerge between the way our American Indian communities are treated in the child welfare system as well as Black and African American families and other communities of color. There are huge disparities still to, to this day. And in this section more than ever, this is another era in which we have prime examples that this is still currently happening. So right now in the state of Minnesota, um, a native child is 23 times more likely than a white counterpart to be removed from the home um, as a result of, of a child welfare case. Um, today, contemporarily, these are the numbers. Um, and we also know that the majority of children being removed are still being placed in, in non-native homes. Now there is a huge, huge push and I'm so thankful for it. There's limitations most definitely. There's things that could be fixed. However, the Indian Child Welfare Act um, was passed in, um, in answer to these gross um, disparities, these gross um, injustices that were happening in the child welfare system. So the Indian Child Welfare Act um, also puts forth that when it kind of holds, holds folks to a higher burden of proof in, in showing um, that a child is in imminent danger to support removal from the home. It also puts forth um, a stipulation that every effort will be made that this child is put into um, a home that matches the culture that they've been raised in. So first and foremost, they look for family members, right? If there's another blood relative who would be willing to, to take that child temporarily. And then it does extend out to maybe not a, an immediate family member, but at least of the same nation, and then of um, indigenous ancestry in general, so on and so forth. There's a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to the purpose for that. There's a lot of misunderstanding in some of the recent Supreme Court challenges that have come up against that law. And where it all cir circles around is the, the, the general society doesn't understand that nation to nation basis um, and that uh, being an American Indian and indigenous person is not merely a question of race. And we know anyway, race is a social construct, right? However, oftentimes people say that the ICWA is unconstitutional because it discriminates um, regarding race. Um, so it's saying that we're getting preferential treatment based on our race as Native Americans. When in fact, what it really is, is our sovereign, sovereign nation status. It's two governments dealing with one another. So anyhow, um, it's a little bit of a tangent, but for anybody who's familiar or may have heard of ICWA before and kind of the controversy around it, um, that's a very real issue um, that is very controversial in Indian country today, um, both contemporarily as well as knowing the origins of, of these systems and where they first came out of. 
Uh, here's another quote by Sheridan. He called it like he saw it, and boy, uh, it's kind of undisputable. So looking at all these different eras we've gone over so far, uh, Sheridan says this. We took away their country and their means of support, broke up their mode of living, their habits of life, introduced disease and decay among them. And it was for this and against this that they made war. Could anyone expect less? Then why wonder at Indian difficulties? For me, especially in regards to the roots in our educational system that go back to the boarding school era, as well as the history that we now understand around child welfare system um, and, and social services, um, I think it's really important for us to note the very negative way that both of these systems were used systematically against our people in the past. Now, hear my heart, that's not to say that people who are educators today, people who are social workers today are bad people. Again, I'm not even saying that those who are involved in these systems specifically at those time periods are bad people, right? And we also need to recognize when our ways of dealing with problems um, was simply wrong. What I want us to understand is that while most policies and systems and the systems that drive them have evolved or changed over time, the underlying principles, biases, and associations remain. So you see here on the screen, a system cannot fail those it was never designed to protect. I feel very strongly about this. Um, with the amount of research I've done on the origins, again, of, of some of these systems, there hasn't been anything done to systematically dismantle these prejudices and these discriminatory biases and associations that many of these systems were built upon. So if we're ever really truly going to transcend, yes, we need to do our individual healing, our individual work, and we need to be very systematic and strategic about making changes within these larger systems that um, we all navigate as well. Any questions or thoughts at this point? You know, now more than ever, what we do now as individuals, as families, as communities, as tribal nations, as city and local and state governments, um, it matters and it will have collective impact epigenetically through breaking cycles, um, through healing for self, for our kids, for future generations, and for our ancestors. You know, there's many things um, as a form of coping that our communities have unintentionally normalized, um, you know, un unhealthy behaviors and cycles. You know, substance abuse is a way of coping with, with pain and trauma. And there is individual responsibility on all these levels. So please don't take it wrong, or please don't hear, um, or please hear my heart in this. You know, healing needs to happen in many ways, and it's on the individual, it's on the family, it's on the community. Um, and there's such a larger spectrum of, of issues to consider as well. All right, we have a question in the box. What do you think would be an effective response to missing Indian women? You know, it's a, a huge question, right? And, and I know I'm sure you're aware of that too. Part of what is so troubling to me when it comes to, to that in particular is how de dehumanized um, our people have been throughout history. You know, the, just the language even, you know, in the uh, Declaration of Independence, the merciless Indian savage is mentioned, you know, and, and the, uh, that's hanging in school classrooms across the, the, the nation, you know, and just that dehumanization aspect. I think one of the things um, that we need to be intentional about in our media, uh, in our conversations with neighbors, so on and so forth, is that value, um, valuing another human being. I think about um, Pocahontas, right, and that story. You know, um, oftentimes in the MMIW movement, um, she's considered a poster child, so to speak, because when you really think about what that story is about, 
right? That story of Pocahontas that's so romanticized by Disney and by pop culture in general. That was a, a young woman, a very young woman, a child who was being abused by an older white man and then taken from her culture, um, taken away and married. And in a way, she is the first missing indigenous woman uh, because of the sexual abuse aspect and, and so much else of it. Um, so again, I think, right, a huge topic, but just beginning to put human faces on things, beginning to recognize how the criminal justice system um, disproportionately serves some communities uh, in comparison with others. Um, you know, there's some things that come into play with jurisdiction um, and who can prosecute crimes that are that take place um, either on or off the reservation um, with or against our tribal community members. There's, there's so many layers to it, but I appreciate that being part of today's discussion and oh, drawing awareness to how connected that topic is with what we're talking about today. So thank you for that. Um, in a few slides here, I'm gonna get into some strategies for healing and for moving forward. Um, and so I think that that topic will come up again in a moment. Thank you for the question. Um, you see here on the screen now, this is a chart. Um, there was a study done, a focus group done um, out of Washington State, um, thinking, talking about, uh, excuse me, um, it was a study, for a focus group for suicide prevention, suicidal, looking at suicidal ideation among Indigenous youth. Um, and these are the statistics that came out of it. So, on the bar graph you see there's a percentage of youth reporting that they've thought about this at least once a day or more than once a day um, all these thoughts of historical loss among our indigenous youth so you can see by and far 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 greater than anything else is the losses of our effects uh, from effects of alcoholism so that comes back at that intergenerational cycles of trauma and adversity right of using alcohol as a coping mechanism. Um, then you can look through the chart and see other correlations that were made. You know, I'm not saying that every Indigenous youth could recognize that, hey, I'm thinking about this because it's of its direct relation to the root cause of historical trauma that took place in the past. However, it's so important to me to know, to note that these are the problems plaguing our kids. Whether they know it consciously or not, we also know that the, the body keeps the score, right? So as we've talked about before, that same process, that toxic stress, that elevation of um, stress levels, stress response system, um, that's very hard on our bodies. In fact, uh, I wanted to mention that the normal, our normal average resting heart rate for most people is somewhere between 70 and 110 beats per minute. Um, for those young people, who have undergone a lot of toxic stress and adversity, um, their average resting heart rate is closer to 130 or 140 beats per minute. And that's a resting heart rate. Can you imagine the toll that's taking on their bodies, on their hearts, uh, I mean, on their heart, on, on their um, whole system of constantly being in that high alert stage? The other piece of toxic stress that I want to be sure to mention is that one of the stress hormones that are released when a person's undergoing toxic stress is cortisol. And um, like many other things in our bodies, many other processes, we know that it serves a purpose. So cortisol itself isn't bad, right? We need it. Um, but what is bad is when it hangs around in the body for longer than it's supposed to. So on average, the time we need to deal with a threat, that fight or flight response is about 20 minutes. So that gives us enough time to respond, right? Whether it's to run away or hide or fight. But what happens with toxic stress is that we spend so much time with flipped lids that our body doesn't have time to recover in between. And when cortisol hangs out in our body for more than 20 minutes at a time, uh, it's actually toxic to brain cells. And that's where the toxic stress piece of it comes in. So it can actually kill or damage brain cells. And that's also part of the physiological reason why. Um, why it's so hard on our bodies, right? Why we're seeing those negative health and social outcomes because of that. So um, the effects of historical trauma on our native communities, we've seen everything from 
a breakdown of traditional Native family values. We've mentioned and talked about several times now alcohol and other substance abuse. Mental health suffers, so we were seeing lots of increased depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation. Uh, child abuse and neglect and domestic violence, right? A lot of that self-inflicted pain, um, you know, those cycles that have deep roots and have continued. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder, general loss of meaning and sense of hope, internalized depression and self-hatred. Um, those are all ways that historical trauma manifests in, in our Native communities. Here's the other piece I want to be sure to touch on. So historical unresolved grief is a result of those historical traumas that have not been sufficiently acknowledged, expressed, or otherwise addressed. So just by virtue of being here today and listening and hopefully learning something, um, you're being a part of the solution. Because for so often, we didn't talk about this stuff. Um, and still, it's really hard to go into communities and to, to bring these things up. Um, everybody, everybody has their opinions and their experiences and their, their perspectives. And um, this can be tough, a tough subject to approach. But um, that in itself is healing. For me, being able to go into communities and to talk about this and to have an audience who, who's signing up on a Saturday <laughs> to sit and, and, and hear this information, that's important. Um, I, I can't say enough about how, how meaningful that is, just that acknowledgement. And, and, and that gets wheels turning in people's heads of, you know, what is my role in this? What can I do? How can I help? How can I do my own healing, right? Um, disenfranchised grief is another product of historical trauma when the loss cannot be voiced publicly or is not publicly acknowledged. The lack of recognition of the generations of loss of American Indians from colonialism, disease, and other factors, and the corresponding lack of recognition of their right to grieve these collective experiences. This is an example of this type of grief. And then we see that internalized oppression, uh, internalized the views of the oppressor and perpetuate a cycle of self-hatred that manifests itself in negative behaviors. So again, feeding into those intergenerational cycles of adversity. So I know I had promised we'd talk a little bit more about ACEs, but I wanna be mindful of time as we are getting to the wrapping up point. One of the things I wanna offer is there are some like primers, some short videos to help um, address ACEs further, um, as well as to share the news with all of you that I was, the last time I was up in Grand Marais, I trained in a cohort of ACE Interface presenters. There's about 20, 20 folks in your community who are now trained in to give um, the, a presentation uh, called Building Self-Healing Communities. Now, we originally had planned uh, when this was going to be an in-person training um, to offer the complete ACES training um, as well as this training because they really do complement each other. That being said, um, part of our contractual agreement with the folks who created that curriculum is that we um, do not offer it virtually and we are not allowed to record it. Um, so the decision was made that we would hold off on that um, presentation itself, but encourage all of you um, to, to learn more about it in the meantime. Um, once, once we're able to gather in larger groups again, I look forward to um, working with folks from your community to be able to offer that um, as well, because that is such a, a crucial understanding for the, this bigger picture also. So keep, keep in contact <laughs> and we can, we can give you more information about that. Now I did mention a little bit about it. And one of the things that are mentioned, or you see on the, the boarding school side of your screen, um, I'm trying to make the connection here between how our communities have been impacted by both ACEs and historical trauma. So many of the things included in the original ACE study um, are all things that took place in the removal of children from their homes during the boarding school era. The separation from parents and families, the widespread physical abuse and neglect uh, that was taking place at these boarding schools, as well as the emotional and sexual abuse that was part of that story. So all of those in themselves are these adversities causing those toxic stressors to be plaguing um, these young people who attend a boarding school. In addition, we also know that that epigenetic inheritance um, of these experiences was passed down to generations that came after um, the boarding school era as well. So that's com compounding um, what we've talked about today in a different way. 
The other thing I want to mention about boarding schools, um, when, especially when I talk to teachers, often I remind them that there's a very good likelihood that one of the students in your classroom has either a parent or a grandparent who was impacted firsthand by the boarding school experience themselves too. So sometimes, you know, it's easy to kind of get caught off guard with dates and numbers, but this, um, this era, the boarding school era, is, is close enough that it still is impacting our communities either directly or generationally only once removed from those who went through boarding school, uh, the boarding school experience themselves. On the other side of the screen, again, you see the two photos of, in this case, three Lakota boys when they first entered Carlisle Indian School versus after they had been there for some time. So that attempted cultural genocide that took place throughout the boarding school era, as well as many of the other eras we talked about, have resulted in the contemporary issues we're seeing in our communities today the disproportionality in terms of our communities impacted by substance abuse, by mental health issues, um, by recycling um, those instances of physical abuse and neglect, as well as emotional abuse, and incarceration rates. At any given time, um, when I check the jail rosters in my area, and I, and I say my area because here in Walker, up in Bemidji, like we are pretty much surrounded Bemidji in particular, right, Beltrami County, um, is surrounded by three reservations, you know, White Earth, Red Lake, and Leech Lake. And so when I think about looking at jail rosters in Beltrami County, and Cass County, and Itasca County, um, we see a lot of disproportionality in terms of the color of the skin of inmates. Now this is, again, not conjecture, this is something that there's been a lot of attention on in my area and, and ways to address it. I talk a lot with the, the chief of police out of Bemidji. Um, he's very interested in learning and figuring out what we can start, what we can continue to do um, to, to ease those disparities. And what I often tell him is we need, need to get officers trained in on these things that we're talking about today. One of the things that's very true is that those of us who have been highly impacted by ACEs, by historical trauma, by those toxic stressors, keep in mind what we talked about in terms of your stress response system. It's way more highly attuned to look for danger and it's way easy, easier activated than the average person. Meaning, I've uh, a question to the audience members, how many of us have said something we later regret or done something we later regret when we're really mad? <laughs> I'm pretty sure every single one of us could say, yep, yeah, that's happened to me. So imagine what it's like working and living in a community when you feel like you're constantly being triggered, constantly having to respond uh, to, to react for survival um, versus respond thoughtfully um, for the more long-term outlook. Um, again, just things to consider. Um, about maybe when we're in our own communities and we see behavior we don't readily understand. Um, I might skip through some of these slides a little quicker. I'm noticing we're, we're time-wise, I do want to allow time for question and answer as well as any discussion that may have come out of this. Um, this slide here depicts these adverse childhood experiences as reported, broken down by race and ethnicity. So this is data from Minnesota. You'll see the black boxes at the bottom of the screen indicate the percentage of the population that uh, reports five or more ACEs. So at five or more ACEs, we start to see really severe differences in health and social outcomes, negative differences in health and social outcomes. And in fact, when we're looking at six or more ACEs, life expectancy tends to drop by 20 years on average. So you see uh, in the far side of the screen are Asian communities in Minnesota, about 4% report five or more ACEs. Our white communities, about 7% report five or more ACEs. Hispanic communities come in at 12%. African American Black communities come in at 19%. Nearly one in five of Minnesota community members are reporting five or more ACEs. In the North our American Indian community, 23% nearly one in four uh, are reporting five or more ACEs. These disparities are real. There's disproportionality 
uh, within how our communities uh, fare um, in the state and beyond. And until we start really looking at where these differences uh, come from, right, the roots, then we're never going to see the type of change that we really want to see for all the health and well being of all of our community members. <clears throat> I love this quote. Um, Abigail Echohawk. Uh, she is a Pawnee woman working for as the director of the Indian Health, Urban Indian Health Institute in, in Seattle, Washington. Uh, and she says, we are not a historically underserved population. My history is one of ancestors who survived so I could thrive. My history didn't start with Western civilization. I am colonially underserved. I am institutionally underserved. And I am historically resilient. Such a powerful statement and such a powerful statement that really urges us to reframe the narrative around the way that we have these types of conversations. You know, you saw one of the, the outcomes um, as a result of historical trauma, oftentimes is internalized oppression and a lack of hope. And language matters. And so for me, thinking about myself, my family, my people as historically resilient on in, or institutionally underserved and colonial underserved tells a very different story than, um, than the common narrative we hear, I think, in, in our world today. So often the onus of responsibility is placed solely on the individual. And please understand I'm not diminishing um, individual responsibility in any of this. However, we need healing at all levels. And part of healing is first reckoning with the problem itself. Um, and so I really do appreciate the opportunity to be here with all of you today, because um, part of this work is spreading knowledge, um, helping others maybe consider, consider things differently and really start to examine what our own roles are in, in moving forward all together as a community um, through the, these very difficult conversations um, that we must have. All right, so I went through that already. Again, here's a hopeful message. So as much as emerging neuroscience, um, you know, it's yielded good news. ACEs are not destiny. So there's a lot said about, you know, these adverse childhood experiences having a negative impact. However, we're not talking about it as a, a straight cause and effect thing, right? So they're not destiny. Um, if our human brain can be hurt, we know it also can be healed. It's up to all of us to aid in that healing, creating communities in which everyone can thrive. And then finally, another quote here by Linda K. Hogan. She's a Chickasaw author. I would encourage you to look up her work. She has a lot of great work. She says this, some people see scars and it is wounding they remember. To me, they are proof of the fact that there is healing. And I really want that to be the overarching message of our time together today. Yes, it's important we acknowledge and come to terms with things that have happened in the past, but not so to stay focused on that trauma. Rather, it is to move forward together. It's to better understand the impacts of trauma, the root causes of the pains we see in our community today, so we can see past that trauma to the person and to the, the root causes, uh, beginning to identify how we can start breaking those cycles of intergenerational adversity and uh, ongoing biases and assumptions coming out of that um, thought process uh, around those eras of historical trauma that our indigenous communities have experienced. Um, so again, transforming perspective, right? From what's wrong with you to what's happened to you. And how can we as a caring community um, aid in that healing? Now I wanna get to some questions. So thank you all for that content. That was a lot of content in a short period of time. Um, I could have expanded on so many different pieces of that. So right now, again, we have about 10 minutes remaining and I wanna be mindful of your needs. I want to encourage you. Um, is it okay now at this point if we unmute so folks can chat a little bit? Yep, happy to do that. 
I will be yeah. allowing you guys to unmute. You will just have to unmute yourself after I've un allowed you to talk. Great. So I've put some questions on the screen, but first and foremost, I just really want to allow open question and answer um, if there's anything that that this has brought up for you or anything you're wondering. And I will be editing this, so please feel like um, you can talk freely. Uh, mm -hmm. This will be the end of the recorded session and we'll go on to an unrecorded part. So right, thank you for those mm -hmm. attended. Mm -hmm. I've put some questions up on the screen too. Feel free to address any of those. Um, what is the makeup of your community? I, I'm, I'm certainly familiar with your location, knowing that your neighbor, Grand Portage neighbors uh, are nearby, that you have others um, within the vicinity, uh, other indigenous communities. Um, but thinking about why this information is important to you and for you and your community, uh, what's important for your community to know about this piece? Are there wisdoms, traditions, experiences you can learn about and share from different parts of your community? 